thank you all for attending the 36th National Pesticide Forum. It has been a powerful day, right? We have laughed, we have cried, we've bonded. <laughs> it's been fantastic. We ate. Really powerful. Yeah, and we ate. Very important. Um, this is the Organizing for Local Policy Change workshop. We have a great slate of speakers. As you can see, we have a lot of speakers. Uh, and they're all working for change in their local community. Uh, which, and they're here to share their stories and their strategies. And I want to launch right into this because we've got a lot of folks and they've got a lot to tell you. Uh, first up is Autumn Ness. She's based in Maui, Hawaii and works with Hawaii grassroots advocates, serves as an aide to the Maui County Council member Ellie Cochran, and heads up the Hawaii Organic Land Management Project with Beyond Pesticides. Working with, she also works with Maui uh, County Parks Department to transition pilot sites to organic practices. She was a leader in the historic citizens movement for a moratorium on GE crops in Maui County, which won at the ballot box, but lost when the chemical industry sued the county. Please welcome on this. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming to this. And I'm really stoked to hear from everybody else. Um, what a great panel and a great day. Um, I'm just going to jump in. Um, our story is kind of convoluted and messy. <laughs> um, I do, like what Drew said, I started my work with the election to get Monsanto off Maui because they test their GE crops um, where we are. And we lost in the courts. And ever since then, our journey to kind of lighten the load of pesticide use on our island has gone in a lot of different directions. Um, so I work with and for a lot of different organizations depending on the need at the time to accomplish that larger goal. Um, we work at the state level on state legislation for better pesticide, pesticide regulation and the pesticide free parks um, project is the latest thing. Um, the slides I have here um, are really illustrate how we built this movement from the very beginning. And it started with Monsanto, but it's grown into this really, really large thing that I'm so proud to be a part of. And um, our focus now has changed to actually like toppling the entire plantation structure of our government <laughs> in the next election. We have a slate of Native Hawaiian um, environmentalists for sustainable ag running for all different seats. And it's really, really exciting. Um, the moratorium election was the first time the plantation vote has ever lost in an election in the state of Hawaii. So um, we have a real chance to change things for the better. Um, okay, so do I push the, is this one? Okay, so the presentation is called Maui versus Monsanto, how we won against the most money ever spent in an American election and built a lasting movement against the chemical industry. We did this with almost zero money. Um, and that's important for I think a lot of us where we're up against these major deep pockets. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is messaging. Um, the chemical companies are really good at convoluting everything and confusing the hell out of everybody. So messaging has to be simple, direct, and factual. And it's really important to stay on the offense and not the defense as much as possible. We found ourselves in these big, deep holes of unraveling these crazy Monsanto messages, and we had to pull ourselves out of that a lot. Um, we fought their spin with straight facts. You just have to keep repeating the facts. That's what they do. They repeat their lies enough where people believe them. So you have to keep repeating your facts. And you have to choose your language. These guys are not farms or farmers. They are chemical companies. And lately on Maui, our newspapers have started calling them chemical companies too. So that's a huge win. Um, these are some of the things that we use to illustrate really complex ideas. Locally, we drew maps, the yellow, Arrows are trade winds, the red, the blue is water runoff. We took each of their spin, their lies, and dissected them into really easy to understand. Um, you know, a picture tells a thousand words. And we flyered the town with all of these um, to tell the difference between good and bad ag. We had someone draw a picture. We made coloring books, um, this kind of stuff. Creativity is a really big deal. Um, we had to find cheap, targeted ways to get our message to the public. Um, knocking on doors, we knocked on 10,000 doors in the moratorium election. And um, we do that, we've done that in the last election, and we're going to do that again this year. And that's how we won. It's free. Um, radio is also a really good and cheap way to get your message out. And it's quickly changeable. You can change a radio message with a recording in a half an hour and put it to the radio station and it's out there. We hand painted the signs because banners are expensive. And when the message changes, you have to get new banners. But with signs, you can just paint over them. So <laughs> we created these signs. This is my front yard. 
and we made human billboards on the side of really busy roads. Um, when we found out through campaign spending law that they spent $8 million in the first round, we painted it on signs and we went out and held it on the sides of busy highways. And it seems really elementary, but it worked. <laughs> um, people started making their own signs, which is cool. <laughs> um, we had marches and we kind of did a spin on this beautiful Aloha Welcome to Paradise thing that you see on all the postcards. And Babes Against Biotech, who I'm also a part of, made calendars as a fundraiser. And not only did we make calendars, but we highlighted local women who are active in either sustainable ag or um, biology, scientists, stuff like that. Um, we took a lot of these things. And for example, this is a table at one of our local cafes. So when you sit down, your table placemat. And we changed these out every <laughs> couple of weeks. Um, so when we got sued after the election, we had to find a cheap way to tell the public what was going on. And we didn't have any money. So for opening day of the state legislature, we printed a banner and ended up on the front page of the paper for free. So this is how we were able to tell the public that we were getting sued and our vote probably isn't gonna mean anything. Um, the next thing, building community through whatever your goal is in the short term, there's gonna be more goals after this. Whatever your win is, the pesticide industry is not gonna go away. So as you're doing this, you have to build the sustaining community through marches, through events, holding your own events, and showing up at other people's events where the people are already congregating. We feed people with local organic um, food donated by farmers at every event. Um, and choosing leaders in your community that already are leaders is a really big deal. Hawaii can be a really segregated place. White people, Hawaiians, Filipinos, um, don't really mix unless you make them mix. So we chose Uncle Alika as we knew each other and he was able to bring our message. All these people behind him wouldn't have showed up. And now all the people in this photo are leaders in our movement. And we've, I've gained great credibility in their community because of him. And he's gained credibility in my community because of me. So it's this lasting thing. Um, this is one of the marches we had before the moratorium, just to give you, again, simple, direct messaging. Monsanto is trying to talk about this farming ban. No, 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 no. It's straight. Monsanto is poisoning Hawaii. Boom. That was our message. Um, this is an example of why it's important to have leaders from each community. This was a um, Hawaiian Immersion School fundraiser. If I had showed up here on my own and tried to register people to vote and get them to sign a petition, not a single person would have talked to me. But Kana, uh, Sana and Kale, their kids go to that school. So we set up the booth. Sana and Kale stood out front. They hooked people, and then they sent them to me. So they got me the credibility I needed to get them registered to vote. Um, and also, the really important thing is you can't just fight the problem. You also have to grow the solution. So we created this spinoff called Outgrow Monsanto. And instead of doing now marches against Monsanto, we have Outgrow Monsanto workdays. And we provide community help to farmers that need workers, which there's no shortage of them, you know? Um, strategic use of social media is a really, really big deal. It's a one thing to have a lot of followers, but it's one thing, it's another thing to have engaged followers. So we ask our social media followers to do things. Babes Against Biotech has 50,000 followers, and when we put up something to ask them to do it, they do it. Um, this is an example of three stages of when we had a hearing at the state legislature. Um, one, we put up a simple graphic asking them to do something. Ask this, call this person's office and ask for a hearing. Then we got a hearing. So the next thing is we asked them to um, send in testimony asking for these things, right? Then afterwards, we asked them to call Representative Luke and thank her um, so that everyone is very engaged through every step of the process. We also live stream almost every single hearing. And during the live stream, in the comment section, we tell the audience what's going on, because this is a really complicated process. So we engage with the audience as they're watching and let them know what that vote just meant or what the next steps are. Um, and that's really important too, I think. Um, I think this is the last part. We, making media work for you is a huge part of our success. The day I learned to write a press release and the better I get at it, the more and better media we get, and it's totally free. If you wait for the media to show up, they're gonna screw your message up. And half the time you won't get in the paper anyway. 
But right now, media, especially print media, is so underfunded and overworked that they actually really like when you do their job for them. Um, so I plan events with a photo and a headline in mind, and I usually pre-write the press release, and then fill in the details and send it right after the event's done. And they print it sometimes, as is, sometimes typos and all. They just put my typo in the, front, in the paper. Um, and the other really important thing is that if one really, really small positive thing happens and you create so much positive media around it, you kind of like strong arm the people who are doing that into going back on the good thing they've just did. You know, for example, um, oh, here's an example of the Outgrow Monsanto event. I wrote this press release myself. I sent them the photos. I even, if you notice where the quote on the right side, I, in the newspaper, am able to question Monsanto's entire business model. A reporter would never print that. But I was able to question Monsanto's business model as being dependent on chemicals and that we are proving that it is wrong. And that was the front page of Maui Now. You know? Um, and this thing, when Beyond Pesticides came to Maui to do the parks training, we blew it up because we were afraid that the parks department would take the training and then say it was impossible. So we created so much media around it that they would be total jerks for not following through. And um, we also invited private landowners like spas and resorts and huge condo and golf course um, people so that um, we could wrap them around in positive PR. And about five of the entities that took the training went full cold turkey right away. And we just blew them up in the PR so that when the parks department says they can't do it, we can say, well, yes, you can. These guys are doing it too. Um, so we're using PR as a way to like corner people into doing the right thing. I think that's the last slide. Yeah. OK, thank you. You did a good job. Thank you so much, Autumn, for sharing those really innovative uh, on the ground strategies. Fantastic. Our, our next speaker is Rachel Berger. She's the president of the local advocacy group Protect South Portland, based in South Portland, Maine which over the past several years has worked not only to pass one of the strongest pesticide policies in the country uh, uh, for landscape cosmetic pesticide use, applying to both public and private property, but also organize the community against fossil fuel interests and promote access to alternative energy. Please welcome Rachel. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm not a professional, so this will be a kind of modest account of very interesting years that we've spent in South Portland. For me, it started, I was, I was going every two weeks to a, an organization called um, Elders for Future Generations, and someone from Environment Maine had just been there to talk about tar sands, and she said, we need a group in South Portland because there was the potential of a pipeline getting reversed so that tar sands would be coming out of South Portland. South Portland is a relatively small town next to Portland. This is in Maine, right? It's a long way off. It's about a 12-hour uh, journey here. Um, good, thanks for putting that up. This is one of my paintings. I will show you more of them later on. So anyhow, when I heard that, I said, I will... I will do that. I will start that group. Now, my thinking was I had already previously had a group that did quite a lot of good called Green South Portland, and it had a very strong leader. So when I came home, I called her and I said, we have to stop the pipeline. She said, sorry, Rachel, you'll have to do it alone this time. She was a very bright, very organized person. She knew how to deal with the city. She knew everyone's name. Everybody knew her. That was not me. Um, so anyhow, I started by calling friends of mine. Uh, one of them was a good writer. She was an editor for a, a fishery magazine or something. And she came up with some what I call good copy and a good graphic. And we sent it out to the whole city. We had three women doing that. Um, sending it out to all the different organizations in the city um, because we knew there was going to be a workshop that a pretty progressive mayor was putting on about tar sands. We also had the biggest room in the city, which was, which was uh, in the community center. Uh, 400 people came, which 
I thought was very good. We don't often get 400 people to a meeting. 50 of them got up to speak against tar sands coming through the city. So this was wonderful. I just sat and kind of wallowed in how wonderful it was. I didn't speak. Um, I generally avoid speaking because I'm not that good at it. Um, after that, we, we didn't actually have a group, but I started calling people that I knew were progressive or potentially people I'd heard of. I, I'd only actually lived there since 2004. Um, so, you know, I wasn't exactly a native to South Portland. Um, so we formed a group. People started coming. About We'd have about 12 to 15 people in our relatively small house. We did that once a week, and we were trying to figure out what to do. Um, one of the first referrals we got, I need some water, um, was, I've lost my place. First referral. Thank you. <laughs> um, oh, it was to Toxics Action. And they uh, told us the best thing to do was to call Beyond Pesticide. So we did that. Oh, no. Do that, and they would send somebody. So they sent us somebody who was, was not really a very easy organizer to deal with, but we did what she said. First thing she did was to put up on the wall, you need to give us your sense of all the, thank you so much, of all the counselors. And that was a new idea for me. To me, organizing was like doing a, you know, going to meetings or, or um, having a, you know, big demo or something. I'd never thought about dealing with officials. So we started doing that. Then she wanted us to do door to door. So we started doing door to door. I hated doing door to door. I was way too shy for it. She said, you have to go and wave and be friendly and smile. That wasn't me. I was nervous. Um, anyhow, I noticed that we were getting about 75% positive response as we, we, we stationed ourselves in different parts of the city and collected signatures. So that was good. Um, eventually, to, <clears throat> excuse me, a lawyer in the group wrote a, uh, an ordinance um, to stop tar sands from coming through the city. It, it wasn't a perfect ordinance, but we worked extremely hard to get it voted for. Um, to get it on elections, we would have to have 900 signatures. We thought we could do that. We had 11 days to do it in. Um, we managed to get 4,000 signatures. Yeah. Extremely hard work. What I am really relating is how a group of people can work together. This wasn't me. Um, actually, my, my partner did a big part of that job. She would be, one person would be calling people to find new volunteers to collect signatures. They would come to our house, then my partner would train them, and then meet them out at a certain place. And this went on every weekend, and then we'd also have, the, have to have them notarized. So we had to organize to have somebody but on the beach to notarize things as they came in. <clears throat> so anyhow, that was exciting. So then there was the campaign. We had a woman who was very talented at organizing people. She had actually worked successfully for Obama in New Hampshire. And we had a terrific experience. We, we rented a place, and everybody had a different job. My job was just welcoming people and, oh, providing food, too. So the election happened. We lost. We lost by uh, 193. Just before then, I had gone, it, gone to buy some sellotape at a store, and I said, so who did you vote for? She said, oh, I, we, we voted for you. She voted the wrong way. The oil company had nine young men going around, basically telling lies, telling people how to vote so that they would win and we would lose. Um, so that was hard. 
Every one of the votes they got cost them $35. We were working on almost no money. So anyhow, and, and we were all volunteers. So when the core then, what happened next? What happened next was, oh yes, the next day, the very, um, moved by one of the councillors who's really very conservative, they, the, the council violated their own regulations and decided to uh, straight away on a moratorium, which actually they weren't supposed to do, but they did it. Um, also a very conservative mayor, and one of our group was very good at making him feel good. Uh, she would always call him and smile and be very friendly. And they wanted, and this was very critical, they wanted a stakeholder meeting that would, all the people in, related to the whole issue of tar sands would, would be present at that meeting and figure out how to, how to make a new, um, um, losing my words, um, ordinance. We said, no, this, we can't do that. You need three people who want to do a good ordinance, not a stakeholder meeting where all the conflicting parties are present. Only one minute left. Okay, I'll be quick. Um, that happened, and a very good ordinance was written, which now is being um, sued. Um, so we're in that struggle. How this all started was simply a number of us had felt that there was a need to, for one thing, I felt like we had a very strong organization and we needed to carry on moving towards an environmentally progressive city. A lot of us had complained about seeing people using pesticides. Um, for my case, it was a family nearby where the children were obviously not doing well. There was a huge lawn very close by that was being regu regularly sprayed. Other spraying was going on in our community. And um, then we did it fairly simply. We, we called, we called um, Jay and Chip and they came and spoke. We first wined and dined them. With, with lobsters that we got for free from our friends. So that was very nice. What we had at that point then, we had been careful to have is to work on getting the right people in the council, and that has been something we've carried on doing. Um, because the, from then on, it just depended who was in the council as to whether we were going to keep this tar sands ban because the council had basically decided on it. Um, so Jay spoke very well, and so did Chip. Jay had only 20 minutes, and Chip had 20 minutes. And then we had somebody from Friends of Casco Bay who spoke about how the uh, shellfish were dying. It would be born, and then it would disintegrate. And they showed pictures of this. So at that point, then when there was, um, the councillors were going to respond, it was una unanimous that we would do this. So it was, this part of it was very simple. Um, what has been harder, oh, then we've had a, the city decided on a sustainability coordinator, so she then took over doing, writing the ordinance. Um, unfortunately, the, some of the staff pushed back and they decided to only do pesticides and exclude fertilizer, which I'm very sorry about because uh, the fertilizer is having a very bad effect on the ocean. So that is going to be our next job is to, is to push for that. And otherwise things are going well and I'm going to quickly show you the calendar I've done to help educate people. So these are paintings I've done for a calendar, which will, exp which will go free to, to anyone in the city, particularly all the families. The children will take them home from school to help families know what to do about lawn care. This is a, um, uh, a mock-up from the, from the printers. So it's got all these words on it. I sent this to my son, so it's simply the, the mock-up. And these are not complete pictures either. 
and you're not getting all the written copy. This one is collecting kelp. Not moving forward. Okay, well, you've got the idea. Oh, it did move forward. It did. Thank you, Rachel, for sharing that journey. That was, that's a great story. Um, next, I want to introduce Kim Conti. Uh, she's the founding member of Non-Toxic Irvine, the City of Irvine Community Services Commissioner, an Organic Landscape Association advisor, and a member of the Irvine School District Pest Management Committee. She's also the reason we're here in Irvine. Non-Toxic Irvine was instrumental in the City of Irvine becoming the first city in Orange County to be maintained organically. Kim and her team now continue her work uh, with groups looking to do the same thing where they live, from Orange County to New Zealand. Please, welcome Kim. Hi, you guys. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I have to say, though, that um, before I get started, it's been so fun to geek out with people that like to talk about soil and, you know, know how corrupt, you know, industry is. And, you know, people ask a lot of times what we feel about Monsanto. And it's not that we're anti-Monsanto. We're anti their practices. We're anti their lack of transparency. Um, we actually recommend one of their organic fungicides for golf courses, you know, and it, it's kind of hard to do it, but <laughs> it's, it is organic and it is safe. So um, it's just, this is, thank you, Jay. I see you back there. <laughs> thank you. Um, and this really kind of all started um, just as parents. We randomly found each other all at the right time. It was a little bit of magic and a little bit of luck. Um, and um, quickly, I, I lived in Bermuda. Um, I found out that the products that I would buy in America were formulated differently in Bermuda, so they didn't have parabens, they didn't have, you know, to extend their shelf life. So the products that were being made in the country where I'm from were made safer abroad than if I was living at home. So I think that's what kind of started me reading labels and as a parent you read labels and you try to do your best to keep your child safe. Um, we left Bermuda and moved to California. I grew up in Connecticut where we just assumed Californians surfed and only ate organic food and they were just light years ahead of where we were on the East Coast only to find out that really wasn't the case. Um, we, I was convinced to chair the 100 Mile Club, which is a great program where it encourages children to run or walk up to 100 miles in a school year. So children in wheelchairs can accomplish this, disabilities, and so it really helped children get active and get outside. So we're doing this in IUSD and uh, went out to the field where we were about to have the children come out and run and there was all these signs out. And it says that Roundup had been sprayed. So. I was just like, well, this kind of defeats the purpose of having these children do something healthy. And I also left a country, Bermuda, where they banned it because of its negative health effects. So I started, you know, asking questions, doing research, and I share this with the PTA president. And she said, I have someone you have to meet. So Kathleen Halal actually um, kind of helped us all find each other. And she had just presented to the PTA board um, the issues with glyphosate and wanting IUSD to move away from it. So we formed, we had random backgrounds. I have a background in advertising and branding. Bob Johnson, who is my partner in crime, he has a background working for the city. And, you know, we just, we just worked together to come up and form a plan to just get this out of our parks where our kids play. You know, I, I have my kids eat organic as much as possible. Um, sunblock, sun safety, and going to this one meeting, I found out that I was letting my boys play on baseball fields that were treated with glyphosate and 2,4-D. So as a mom, I failed. You know, I, I remember crying, um, calling my husband on the way home, and my dad used to play for the Yankees. So the boys have been playing baseball even in Bermuda when cricket was the sport. Like nobody played baseball in Bermuda except my boys. Um, so when I found this out, I, I felt like I failed, and um, we're not a huge soccer fan family, but. Um, my husband said, okay, they, they, you know, maybe we can find another sport. And I'm like, it's the soccer field. It's, it's the baseball field. It's the playgrounds. It's the parks. So we wanted to come up with a plan. 
So we formed our team, we did our fact finding, we found out that vetted science is very important. Peer reviewed sound science. Glyphosate unfortunately causes enough damage um, that can be you know, really proven. We don't have to blame it for everything wrong in the world. You know, sadly, there's enough out there that you can just share. Um, I think what happened after a mission statement and developing our brand, so they knew we were organized, and every time that we'd send out messaging and use our the free social media, right? I mean, we're all volunteers. Self-funded um, was reaching out and getting academic advisors. You know, we're lucky that we have UCI. And um, we actually, our, our original gangster, our OG advisor, we reached out to Dr. Lamphere after we saw Little Things Matter. And we just, at the time, asked if we could share his video on our website. He said, not only can you share my video, my brother will make you guys a logo, and I'd love to be your advisor. So we're like, this, you know, we hit the jackpot. So um, from that, Dr. Lanfear then introduced us to Dean Baker at UCI, and we hunted down Dr. Bloomberg, which is, he's right here. Um, and it really helps going into meetings and, you know, bringing these, you know, it, it just gives you the credibility you need to have the conversations with elected officials in your, in five minutes, right? Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Drew. Okay, here we go. Um, and you want to stay very politically neutral. I think what is unique in our situation, we were lucky that Irvine's been able to um, be organically maintained for two years from insects, you know, to rodents, to weeds successfully. Um, and after that, we've reached out to other cities. And every city that we've had this policy move forward and make happen has been brought forward by a Republican. So I think that just proves that it's a nonpartisan issue. You know, safe fields for kids is just, you know, that it's a human, it's a basic human right is what it is. And we were lucky enough to um, form this dream team and get our branding or everything together. And when we did the petition, we were contacted by Mayor Choi of the city of Irvine and Christina Shea, and we, we were given the okay to have a meeting. We were so excited. We got our slides ready. We came up with a plan. We you know went over who was going to speak to what point. And um, when we met Christina, Christina, can you say hi? She's back there. She's right there. Vice Mayor Christina Shea is back there. Hi, Christina. So Christina um, is a cancer survivor, and all of the, the points that we spoke to, you know, she just really understood and she she just saw the need to bring this forward so on the city side which I think is really helpful you know um, as a community you can reach out to your elected officials you know they're not in some town hall with a sealed door you know they're accessible and they want to hear from you know the public and that's what we did and Christina decided to move this forward and she worked with city staff to come up with this beautiful policy the policy that has you know given us an organic city um, and she will speak more to that later. Um, I have to get to all my graphics now. Let's see. Drew. Mm. I probably want to talk too much. I turned it off. <laughs> oh, there we, there we go. Okay. So, um, again, social media is free. So, well, except for the site hosting, but that's okay. My... I love my husband. Thank you, husband, for funding that. Um, Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, keep people engaged. Let people know you're going to meetings. Um, and let's go back. I mean, it's just the advertising. It's just sharing this. This is crazy. DDT was, you know, all of these things were marketed to us just like glyphosate. You know, it is, we are told it's safe, right? They're telling our landscapers it's safe. They're telling all of our elected officials that it's safe until enough people get sick and enough people ask the questions, and then they'll just reformulate something else. But um, IUSD is now organically maintaining all 44 of their schools, like completely organically on the outside, and then we came up with a progressive pest management policy because California is known as the IPM state, and Monsanto has learned how to work their way into their toolbox, and they've made it extremely toxic. And we just want to get to a progressive pest management policy where it's a living, breathing document that we can constantly update and not only make the field safe, but 
the cleaning agents inside, the VOCs, the air quality, Wi-Fi, all of those things are factored in. We want to stay away from synthetic turf because we don't want to play whack-a-mole. You know, we don't want to reduce exposure from a carcinogen in the form of a landscaping herbicide and just replace it with a different, you know, way for that child to be exposed through a different product or a different experience. And that is where we went yesterday. Whoever's on the field trip, that was in December. So, I mean, I think it even looked more beautiful um, yesterday. Um, yes, that is concrete, dirt. It was, it's, if you had a tennis ball, I mean, you literally, we were joking, you could just bounce it. It was fine. Now, um, well, that was December, and then yesterday it's even greener. Chip was asking for the slides to get it. I mean, it's so beautiful. And that was within 12 months of just, stopping the synthetic inputs and just healing the soil. It's all about the soil. Um, city of Irvine, we're not done here, even though the city of Irvine is organically maintaining all the city space, we still have ag sites. We have ag exposure. We have strawberry crops, row crops. Uh, they're fumigating twice a year for nematodes um, within the buffer zone of elementary schools. And, you know, this needs to stop. So, again, we have to focus our attention on that. We have over 400 HOAs. They all have separate boards. Um, that's been interesting working with, but we've been successful. And I think you just celebrate. You celebrate our elected officials. You celebrate a sign. You put that sign in your park. If it's organically maintained, let your kids run barefoot, roll in the grass. They're safe. They're protected. And it's something to celebrate and not a lot of people know. And this is our map. So this is, this is why we're not done. Our OC Parks is still synthetically maintaining two parks within city limits. OC County is still maintaining all of the flood, the jetties. Um, per their policy, they're only allowed to use Ranger Pro. So, you know, we get contacted from residents saying, um, we thought Irvine was organic. I'm like, we're trying our best, but unfortunately there's county, there's city, there's over 400 HOAs, so it's, it's constant. We're working with UCI, we're working with the Irvine company, um, but the ag sites are something where if it's conventionally maintained, it shouldn't be wrapping a, a high school. You know, I'm, so we're working on that. These are um, the cities that have switched. San Juan Capistrano, Burbank was great. We went up and met with them on Thursday. They passed a policy that next Tuesday, just because city council wanted out of their parks. You know, we had the moms come, the children come. If, if you are in this process, you go to a city council meeting, you just have your kids, just even if it's one sentence, not one sentence, one thing that they say, it just reinforces why we're doing this. This is why we're all here, really. It's just our pets can be safe, our natural resources can be safe. And Carlsbad showed us up, by the way, because they're also transitioning their city-maintained golf course to organic practices. So that, that will travel to play golf there. And then um, this, you know, teamwork, neutral tone, vetted science thanks to our advisors, and simple, clear messaging, and then bring solutions. So we're constantly meeting with city staff in Irvine to bring them new products. And of course, all these manufacturers want to bring you the new best, you know, roundup, you know, alternative. But I'm happy to say that we do have um, an electrocyte out there that's systemic. We have an organic growth um, plant regulator. So we want to update their toolbox, but with tools that don't harm our children. And then, I mean, again, we're all groupies of Rachel Carson. <laughs> so <laughs> we like to end, you know, with this. It's, it's you know, and Jane Goodall has a, a similar um, quote, but it, we just have to stop the poison because our children are not going to be able to even have children in the rate we're going right now. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kim. Thank you so much for sharing that story. Next up, we have Joel and Kian Schulman. Uh, they're the founders of Poison Free Malibu, which works to educate the public about the problems with pesticides, how they affect wildlife, and our total environment. And they also work to offer viable solutions. Joel and Keon organize in Malibu and throughout the state of California. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Joel, obviously. And <laughs> it's great to hear about all these different uh, 
uh, activists that we've uh, been learning from and, and learning from us, I hope. But our problem is a little different in that um, it doesn't really, it's, it's more of a wildlife uh, nature problem than human. Therefore, a lot of people were not as aware of, uh, of it as, uh, as glyphosate, for example. And uh, so one of our main goals was to get the facts out to people. And when we did, we find out people are very enthusiastic for our cause. So we, we look at our, our goal as to get the science that is known to the decision makers and to get policies changed. And uh, our issue is the rat poisoning of wildlife. I'll show another slide on this to explain it in more detail. So our methods, what we've been doing, is, is, is uh, seeing what's actually happening with rat poisoning from the consumer point of view, from the pest control uh, uh, point of view, from the homeowners association point of view, what is actually happening, tell the public about it and give them alternatives which are better. We have, uh, as people have mentioned, it's really important to make connections with the media and we've had some great interactions with newspapers and radio, etc. Then we um, go for political action to actually make the change happen. So the key with us is to, is to get the science and translate it for public consumption with the participation of the scientific research and the scientists themselves. And the result is increased uh, public awareness and government action. And uh, this week has been intense for us because, as I'll tell you in a moment, we are working on a as California Assembly bill right now, which has been dominating our lives for many hours a day. And that, was even, that happened after I made these slides. I would have made them a little different. So who we are is we are a small group in Malibu. We started there because we're in the Santa Monica Mountains, which is a wonderful natural area. Um, we make alliances with all kinds of other groups, large and small. We have great coalitions that we uh, all support each other. And um, that's how we get things done, because we network like crazy. I would like to add uh, something here in that um, how we got started, we actually uh, uh, requested resolutions from our city. Uh, uh, we started uh, approximately five years ago because a mountain lion was found dead in our local park. I called up the National Park Service and I said, how did this mountain lion die? How does a, how does a 150 mountain, a 50, 50 pound mountain lion die uh, in our parks? And they said rat poison. And that was a very curious uh, uh, situation for me. I says, how does a, a mountain lion die from a tiny mouse? And as we did research, we found out that 80 to 90 percent of our wildlife was being poisoned in our local communities. So uh, I started, I didn't know what to do at that point. I thought, OK, what I could do is just go up and down our city and find out who's uh, selling the poison. Uh, I, got, I went from store to store. I went from the softer, uh, 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 the softer uh, businesses to the harder businesses. So I went to our local businesses that I knew one to one, and then I moved on to the chain stores like CBS and Ralph's and things uh, where they sold them. After I got those uh, commitments from them, uh, I went off to our city council and I said, let's do a resolution. Let you be the example. You, be, you are the, the father, uh, the parents of our local community and let's do something about it and, and give us a resolution that you as a city will not use these poisons. I'll, I'll give them the, the few in a minute, but since that point, uh, we had multiple other cities knock on our doors. We have 11 cities that have knocked on our doors that said, we want to get rid of these poisons also. How do we do it? We work with 11 cities. We gave them our, uh, what, what needs to be done and the problem that was happening in all the cities. And basically, it was exclusion and sanitation that I had discovered that it was not just uh, 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 the solution was uh, sanitation and exclusion, not using these poisons. And uh, as we went on through these cities, it was realized more and more that we could, we could put our hands in locally, but we also have to keep our other hand in governmental and laws because there are oceans of these bait boxes out there in all our HOAs, in our schools, which are very sensitive to me. I'm a, re I'm a registered nurse, and I know the impacts that these pesticides have on our children. And uh, uh, it was a, it's a slow process, and it's still going on now. But as I say, we've gotten 11 cities with these resolutions, but this is not where we, we can really make the change. And the really how we make real change is by, uh, is by doing uh, laws, 
by, by changing the laws. And our most important law that we need to change and focus on, which Joel will explain in a bit, is preemption. Preemption is a chokehold on all of our communities. And once we allevi alleviate this chokehold of, of, of preemption, we're giving, we give the power back to the people. We give the power back to our local communities, to our schools, to our, 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 our cities, our HOAs, and they can determine. We, uh, we want to determine the power of, of our determination of how and if we want to use these pesticides. That is what we need to overturn. Go ahead, Joe. OK, I'll just go really quickly through the nature of our problem, just to let people know, which is uh, these poisons that are put in the hard plastic boxes uh, to, uh, to, to take care of what are conceived as rodent problems. And the rats and mice and gophers or other animals are, are poisoned and do not die. They do not die and stay in the boxes. They are eaten by first and second level predators who become poisoned in turn. And that's the basic nature of it. And now how bad is this? this? Here's our most important slide. This is the science that we are very fortunate to get in the Santa Monica Mountains from the local National Park Service and UCLA working together and the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. The basic number is 90%. 90% of predators, owls, hawks, bobcats, coyotes, mountain lions, et cetera, have uh, exposure to uh, rat poison at various levels. And these are the animals mm -hmm. that we rely on to do our own natural rodent control, and we're poisoning all of them. OK, and uh, I'll go through this really quickly. This started in 2004 when the first mountain lions died, two of them within two weeks of, of each other, in Simi Valley. Uh, which got this that started out this whole uh, effort to, to solve this problem. It's still happening. This is October 2017. P41 died with six different rodent poisons in a system, meaning you know, dozens and dozens of it's an ocean of, of rodents, poison rodents that these predators are living in to get six different, which means dozens of different products uh, for, through, through the mice. Uh, bobcats are, are, I could go into detail, but bobcats are a big victim. Owls, if you haven't heard owls in your neighborhood for a while, this may be the reason. Uh, coyotes are big victims. Uh, children, um, children under, uh, uh, under the age of six, um, as compiled by the National Poison Data System, 8,800 were reported to, be to have been exposed to anticoagulant rodent poisons. This is uh, 2014, uh, this particular data. And, the pest control companies say, oh, we have to have these poisons. We have to protect poor children from rodents. Uh, and that's true. But that's a really terrible way of doing it because but especially children living, uh, living below the poverty line are disproportionately affected by being exposed to rodent poisons. Not the rodents, but the rodent poisons. So it's like ridiculous to substitute one problem with possibly an even worse one. The correct problem, the correct solution is to solve the problem by, uh, by this kind of method. What is the solution? Here's the actual solution, <laughs> as we all know, and, and it's the same theme. This, uh, is a, this, is a, this is a restaurant in Malibu. And I thought we, we only had the problem in Malibu when I first started. I thought, what a filthy city Malibu is, and how are, how are you going to deal with all this? And besides all this, the, the trash here, you'll find pores and bait boxes next to it. Every single city you will go to, you will find exactly the same situation. So what is the solution? The solution is simple. Sanitation and exclusion. OK, we're basically running out of time, so I'm going to skip all this and go to the, uh, our political. Um, we have really good connections with the media. LA Times is great. Not only do they cover the story, they write editorials. And, and, uh, uh, the, the LA Times is great. Last week, KFI Radio, the top uh, talk radio station in LA, this great guy, Dean Sharp, the horse whisperer, had us on for two hours. A lot of fun. Uh, there was a movie made about P-22, the, the mountain lion in <coughs> Griffith Park. Uh, it talks about, we are in it. Uh, we go to the showings. We've been to about 15 showings. We talk after the, uh, after the movie. We make a lot of great allies and create new activists. OK, now, here's, our, the, what, here's what's happening right now. You can, you can have all this interaction as long as you like and educate people, but you really got to use, you can't educate everybody. You got to have laws and regulations. Preemption is number one. Um, this is a law in California that forbids localities from regulating pesticides, as many of you know. 
the history, it's not, there's nothing rational about this. This was due in the 1980s, Mendocino County did not like its children being sprayed by herbicides. So they passed a law banning it. The agriculture industry fought this all the way to the California Supreme Court and lost. Okay, so then they got their lobbyists to go to the legislature and pass a special law to ban localities from regulating pesticides. That's what preemption is, and that's how it happened. And that's why we have, when, when uh, I have 11 cities, and I have, I have constituents call me up and they say, hey, I thought we passed a resolution, a, a ban against these poisons, and yet I have to explain to them very clearly that because of preemption, because of the laws that these pesticide pit companies put on top of us, we cannot ban it, but we can do it privately. And that's why we pass resolutions. The city itself can ban it uh, on their private property, parks and, 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 and areas, but uh, a, a law cannot be generally passed across because of this preemption law that the pesticide companies paid, uh, made just for themselves. So we've got to deal with that at some point. And this is the resolutions that Keon just mentioned. And here are the cities. This is the Santa Monica Mountains. And here are the cities that we went to to pass resolutions, which is great, great for public education, but doesn't have the effect of stopping rodenticides. Mm -hmm. So what we got, uh, here's something that does. If any of you are, have any overlap with the coastal zone, and if you know what that is, you might, the cold, in the coastal zone, because there are special state regulations, localities can control, this is not well known, localities can ban road, uh, pesticides in the coastal zone, but there's a, a certain procedure for doing that. Please come see us right after this. We are trying to start a movement to protect the coastal zone up and down the state of California using this special exception to preemption. This is, we're doing, this is great. And like LA County has protected this big white area in the middle of the coastal zone, uh, of, of the Santa Monica Mountains. No, anti, no anticoagulants or other toxic chemicals can be used in, in a large part of the Santa Monica Mountains using the coastal zone using the Coastal Act. Again, we, we work with the local mm -hmm. legislators to get that passed. Yep. Okay, here's what we're doing right now, and this is what's obsessing with our, our lives right at the moment. <laughs> we, have a, uh, uh, we have a bill going through the Assembly, California Assembly 2422. When I wrote this, I put, see, April 10th, Environmental, uh, Environmental and Safety and Toxic Materials Committee. I was wondering when I got here today, what would I say? Well, it passed, four to one, and uh, now it's going to another committee, the, uh, the, the Water, Parks, and Wildlife Committee, and uh, we're doing so well that we send out, we spread out the word, like we, we, we solicit uh, support letters uh, for this, and uh, we've got, these guys are getting, the legislators are getting mobbed with hundreds of, of emails supporting this, and we just got some uh, emails yesterday saying, hey, have mercy on us. So again, you know, uh, yeah. we again the laws. We got to get the laws down. There's thousands. There's oceans of these bait boxes out there. So we can be the example with the resolutions, all the cities. But your next door neighbor is still using poisons. So we we try to do the best we can. We try to eliminate all of the rodenticides. However, uh, as we learned. Uh, uh, that uh, the pesticide industry is very strong and agriculture is very strong. So we've been having some pushback. We had to make some uh, concessions, but in general, uh, we hope we're going to be moving this forward. We've got huge amount of support. At least 50 uh, uh, agencies are behind us. We've got thousands of, of, of letters of support behind us. Uh, but then we have all these other committees and special interests that want to still use these poisons. So we do make, we are making some concessions and I'm, we're learning a lot uh, through legislation. But as again, legislation is the key and we must go to preemption and then we'll be freed up to do whatever we want. Right, so uh, this is an example of how we, you can translate the science to political action. We've gone this whole trail. Uh, please contact us if you'd like any more information. Uh, at our email and our website and our Facebook page. Uh, yes, I'd also like to say Malibu is poison free uh, for about a year and a half. I worked on, uh, personally, I've worked on a, uh, a poison free policy with the city. Uh, uh, we also had a lot of problems with our, our local communities uh, complaining about glyphosate being sprayed and 2,4-D in our lawns. And uh, we, uh, we took that up, Poison Free Malibu took that, uh, that up and uh, I rallied up our local uh, forces, our local uh, community members, our schools, and we went to the city council and we said, 
we want a pesticide-free policy here, and we want to get rid of everything. We have a pesticide-free policy now. Our, our official policies is uh, now being uh, evaluated by an ERR process, but we don't have an organic policy per se. We have a pesticide-free policy, which means we don't just replace a synthetic pesticide with an organic pesticide. You have to give us a real understanding of why you want to use that organic pesticide. And as, as we wrote the policy, organic pesticides can be used only under emergency condi conditions. And uh, the way you deal with any situation uh, in a uh, situation such as this, uh, we use a step-up policy. Sanitation, teaching, environmental enrichment, preventative actions, and the, the precautionary pr principle is the up, step-up policy. Thank you very much for your work, and thank you for discussing preemption, which is really the, the bane of a lot of the local work that we're doing uh, around the country. So thank you very much. We have a lot of resources at Beyond Pesticides website on preemption. Please, please take a look at that. Uh, next up, we have Angel Garcia. He's the founder and chair of the Coalition Advocating for Pesticide Safety and is also a community organizer for Californians for Pesticide Reform. Mr. Garcia works with farm workers and Mexican indigenous communities in the San Joaquin Valley around environmental concerns. And for you folks uh, watching on YouTube, please go and uh, watch the farm worker panel that we had uh, earlier in the day. I know the folks here um, know how powerful it was, and I strongly encourage you to do that. So please welcome on how. Thank you for the, the introduction. Um, Really, it's not, it's, I don't do much. It's, it's really the people that, that are doing a lot of the work and, and really giving up a, a lot of their precious time to be with their families to like really push for some sort of real change um, at the very local level. A lot of what I'm gonna be saying it overlaps with what's already been mentioned or discussed, but um, I wanna start off with contextualizing where um, like Tulare County a little more. So um, first and foremost, uh, Tulare County is, um, is big ag. Uh, it's big ag where we have over a, uh, I believe it's, uh, last time I checked, it was a $7 billion industry. And as mentioned earlier, um, they use 17.6 uh, 17 uh, million dollar, or pounds of pesticides. And oftentimes, um, what's normal there is you'll see a lot of community mem or communities or uh, what we call their um, unincorporated communities, which are essentially um, a cluster of homes. In, um, out in the peripheries, out in the fields, like out in the middle of, of nowhere, pretty much. And um, they're surrounded by, by conventional agriculture, whether it be citrus, whether it be uh, vineyards, uh, which are most, some of the most common ones. But um, so these unincorporated communities, it's one of the things to really mention is that we, um, these, these communities lack a lot of, uh, lack a lot of uh, infrastructure. So think of it as they, don't, they oftentimes don't have paved roads, they don't have sidewalks, they don't have lighting at night. Um, so some of them have very poor sewer systems. Um, and then a lot of times they rely on like independent kind of uh, water wells, private wells. And um, so that's sort of, of the community that we work with at Coalition Advocating for Pesticide Safety. And um, so when we're talking about bringing change and, and going to the city council, it looks very different in Tulare County. It's, it's a whole different thing. Um, whenever we try to uh, bring it up to like school boards or city council members, um, we end up getting letters of retraction uh, from support. And why is that we end up realizing that a lot of these folks have ties to like conventional and big ag. And that's been a major hurdle. <laughs> but, um, but there are positive things to take from this. So, oh, yay. So first and foremost, we have um, some pictures here that you see. Too. So to your, to your left, uh, it's, it's, this is uh, Maria Brito. She's a, um, one of, uh, a member of the coalition. And she, um, this is her doing a report and kind of illustrating how her daughter has uh, respiratory problems. Her home is a, is, a, is a trailer home and is surrounded by, uh, by citrus in the community of Cutler Rossi, uh, which is also in Tulare County. And she's pretty much um, telling the story of how her daughter um, would get major asthma attacks um, at night during peak spray uh, season. And oftentimes the most common uh, method of application of pesticides over there 
um, uh, is through air blasters. So they're like cylinder shape with nozzles at the end and they just burn, like blow out the pesticides. And it's, um, it, and it's done under the premise, I believe that, you know, there will be drift happening. And that's, uh, so she's telling the story and um, what you can't, maybe, maybe if you focus in on her um, right hand or left hand, she's holding medication there. And there's a table that you can't see from this picture, but there's a table just full of meds. Last time I checked in with her, um, she's in Tennessee. She was able to move um, out of that community. Um, she had some family, so she, she was able, but not many can. And so that's something that, you know, um, a lot of, like, as mentioned earlier by some of the farm working youth, that's something that, that happens in those communities, respiratory problems, asthma, um, and autism is, is also a, a common um, uh, problem in, in these communities. And about autism, one of the things that we're starting to realize and through some of the public health officials is that um, this, uh, there is a growing number of autist, autistic kids in, in the area. But one of the things that makes it hard to kind of quantify that is that uh, in the Latino community, it being having a child that's autistic is seen as a stigma, a major stigma. So folks are like um, not really uh, accepting it or still processing the fact that their child might be born with autism. And that's also uh, plays into um, really getting them involved as well. So that's been one of the ways that they've motivations for them to like make a difference. Um, and then to, to our right, you see, um, you see some of the folks there from, from Tulare County. That was one of the marches that we had uh, around the school buffer zones, which uh, came into effect at the beginning of this year. Uh, and it's the school, the quarter mile buffer. And you know, the coalition was really involved with that effort in Tulare County. Um, let's see here. So just a quick overview, you know, it's uh, just talk about uh, CAPS a little bit and then some um, mention and, and also make mention of environmental uh, justice mention our organizing approach and then some of the current um, actions that we have going. Okay, so yeah, so quickly, you know, $6.9 billion industry. Um, it's uh, the third county that uses the most pe uh, agricultural pesticides in the state. Uh, we're looking at 17.6, population's uh, roughly around 460,000. And uh, around 64,000 of the population in Tulare County is, uh, are Latino. Um, so just quickly, these are some of the ideas that we have as a, as a coalition. We have this idea of power of unity, so we can't really achieve much without each other. And uh, one of the things that you know, we definitely want to highlight is everyone brings something to the table. It doesn't matter the background, doesn't matter who they are, immigration status, whatever. Everyone can bring something to the table. Uh, the other thing is this, uh, the importance of inclusion. So we definitely got to be outreaching to allies or uh, organizations. We've been outreaching to some local um, uh, unions and here and there we've had some successes, but, um, but it's really important to have allies that will stand um, by us when it comes, when times get hard. Um, and then this whole idea of community empowerment, right? Um, a lot of people are often um, not given the opportunity to really, really assert um, um, their voice and elevate their stories. So we try to definitely hi highlight that. So one of the interesting things about us is that we do our, our, our best to definitely have these meetings be as uh, as inclusive as possible. And so we have them and we, we offer them bilingual, so simultaneous. And sometimes we even have um, each other, um, they can attest to this, that we have uh, simultaneous interpretation going uh, even amongst ourselves. And we make it a, we make it a point to definitely have uh, that available for people. So everyone can participate. So anyone can just come and really just engage. So yeah, this is a quick picture of, uh, of a beautiful day. It was a beautiful day there in Tulare County. This was back in uh, late of 2016. Um, this is a very uh, rare sight in Tulare County. Um, you won't see that often, especially around the issue of pesticide reform. Um, so we have um, the coalition um, did a... Uh, a rally dash march um, in Tulare County when Department of Pesticide Regulation hosted one of, uh, I believe it was four or three um, public hearings. And to our surprise, one of them was in the city of Tulare. So we definitely um, mobilized folks and really um, 
amped up the pressure and, you know, had signs. People uh, were, like, just putting on social media. Social media is free, so that's always something that we're trying to also use. And it was, it was such an empowering day for everyone that was part of it. Um, people, some of the people there had never been part of a, a march that related to pesticides. Oftentimes, we're also fighting the immigrants' rights fights. And it's, it's just like we're spread too thin. But this, for this time, on this occasion, we were able to like really start addressing pesticide reform stuff in Tulare County. But um, I'd like to quickly just, um, I was, oh my gosh. Um, that was quick. Okay, so quickly, yeah, this is the, the a common site in Tulare County. So that's an air blaster that you see there to your, um, to your left. And oftentimes, that, like, that's a common site across homes uh, where you see that going. And most recently, our local authority, who is the, um, our county agricultural commissioner, um, the response that we get when, when we report this is, we don't regulate smell. We recently uh, brought that to her attention uh, at a meeting last, uh, like, two weeks ago. And, um, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's just preposterous how Department of Pesticides' own materials clearly state that uh, smell is a sign of exposure, yet, you know, you have our local authorities saying the contrary. And so that's some of the, the hurdles that we have in, in Tulare County. The, the picture in the middle there is a schools. It's a school. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a black top. It's a parking lot for uh, school staff. And if you see clearly, there's a chain link fence. And across from that are orange groves. And that orange grove is being sprayed on. This is in broad daylight. We had one of the mothers take a picture of it. Um, so you see like a little kind of a mist in between some of the rows there. Yeah, it's, it's pesticides. Um, and then we have um, to, your, uh, to your right, those are boxes of um, herbicides. But um, you know, on some occasions, we've had folks um, send us pictures of, of um, Lord's Band, which is chlorpyrifos. And they just burn that stuff in the middle of the fields. And so that's, that's some, some, some of the, the things that we, we kind of go, go through um, in terms of like when it comes to community organizing and, and, and like talking to our, our representatives. It's a different, it's a different thing in, in Tulare County. It plays out differently. And so yeah, so this is another thing, um, cash investigation. I mean, media has been instrumental. I gotta stop, but um, I'm gonna just keep going a little more if you don't mind. Um, so one of the things that I wanna just guys to take away from this is we need to like we need to create a new paradigm shift we need to definitely include farm working people as mentioned by the young folks earlier uh, in this effort and we need to really like connect with each other because I feel like we're in silos we have these great efforts going on here in Southern California but we also need um, we need you all to also like help us out in, in Tulare County we, we need to work together and I think that that's the only way that we're, we can really be transformative and really bring about change. Um, the, the coalition, before the coalition existed, it was a kind of a one, one organization kind of thing. And it was getting a lot of pushback. But the moment that we started kind of just bringing a coalition together, it made a, a, a big difference. And so I really encourage uh, all folks to like really connect with some of us, uh, some of the youth are right there, um, to really just start building these the exchange ideas. But beyond that, commit to the exchange ideas. Because that's what we need to do. We need to have this commitment to each other, commitment to the, our efforts. And um, I really want to invite everyone on, on May 22nd. So mark your calendars, please, if you can. We need you. Uh, but we're going to be um, going before the Visalia Unified School Board, which is the biggest um, school board in Tulare County, to pass a, uh, a, non, um, a glyphosate ban uh, in their IPM. And so we can definitely use everyone here to like help us out with that and put pressure on our local school board. May 22nd, it's gonna be in, uh, in the city of Visalia in Tulare County. Can you put that on beyond? Uh, yeah, certainly. Um, so quickly, um, our, our outreach effort, um, lived experience, community empowerment, know the community. One of the things that I wanna also like you know, highlight is, it's not always about like just in, uh, like translating the materials in like the respective language that the community speaks. It's not just about that. I mean, one of the mistakes that we're seeing is that folks are like, you're, you're probably familiar with the term of like indigenous Mexicans. 
And um, oftentimes people are saying, oh, you know, we need to interpret that in like the indigenous uh, language. But what they don't realize is that the indigenous language is not a, necessarily a written language. It's a pictographic language. So um, it, like it, even if they do like interpret it or write it in, in, in like the respective language, it won't make sense because people just, they communicate verbally. So radio, um, uh, TV uh, interviews, those have been very effective in getting the word out and really inviting people um, to like really just be part of this or be part of other like um, related efforts. And um, yes, so just to wrap it up real quick, um, it's not fair, we, we each got 10 minutes and it's just not enough, right folks? Um, but uh, yes, um, I, yeah, I just wanna invite everyone to like really connect with us outside of this room. There's so much to exchange, so many ideas to like share with each other um, and strategies and you know, just really, 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 let's like commit to these ideas of um, empowerment and so Empowerment comes in the form of um, commitment. So thank you. Um, and uh, yes, we'll be out there to be receptive to your ideas. And yes, all right, thank you. Thank you very much for discussing the challenges of organizing in frontline communities. Um, and I, I really wish we had more time here. I know there's, there's so much work going on and there's there's so many great, there's so much energy going on in this room right now. Uh, I wanna really go quickly. Uh, I'm gonna introduce Susan Junefish. She founded Parents for a Safer Environment in 2002 when her son was three years old and continues to work as a full-time program director pro bono. Susan has given over 90 presentations over the past 14 years to organizations including hospitals, schools, elected officials, and service organizations throughout the Bay Area and has worked on many legislative bills receiving awards from the California State Legislature and locally for protecting public health and the environment. Please welcome Susan Junefish. Hi, everybody. I wanted to go last to see, you know, how much time it was going to take to go over things. So I'm going to kind of be unconventional and maybe just skip over our background because what you guys really want to know is what tips could we give you, gold nuggets, to help you progress, make, uh, you know, fast progress in the projects you're doing. Could I see a show of hands? How many of you guys are working uh, to effect policy change on pesticide issues in your community? Okay, so like 80% of you. So I'm gonna jump right into the, the gold nuggets that I wish somebody had told me many, many years ago. So I've been doing this for 16 years. And then if we have time, then I'll go through our, uh, our organization's background and you could always look it up on the internet. I've got, I brought cards. Okay, so one of the things that I haven't heard yet from, this, um, from the presentations, and I, you know, it's like there's amazing presentations going on right now. There's a legal uh, group. I wish I was there too, but there's something that I want to bring up because I bet you it's brought up there and you guys should know this. Do you know about the injunctions that the Center for Biological Diversity brought on? They promulgated a lawsuit against the US EPA and won. So uh, let me tell you about this. Did you know in the state of Washington, Oregon, and California, there's something called the salmon steelhead trout injunction? If you have any of those like 26 species of fish swimming in your rivers, they cannot use like about 60 types of different, 60 uh, pesticide, pesticide active ingredients. That includes glyphosate, triclopyr, just about every pesticide that the most commonly used pesticides by public agencies. Uh, as well as every rodenticide, every anticoagulant rodenticide I've ever seen public agencies use. That's very powerful to know. And the way it's promulgated is by a lawsuit. But you don't have to promulgate a lawsuit because that's time consuming. So what we do is we share the information with their county, Contra Costa County, that immediately triggered them investigating it. They didn't even know about it. And then they proceeded to hire a biologist and now they have to check everywhere they spray to make sure there's no endangered and protected species there, okay? So let me tell you about the second injunction, the California red-legged frog injunction, okay? And then there's the Bay Area injunction that covers just the Bay Area for about 11 protected species, and there's again about 60 pesticides on that li list. So what happens is that you have to have a buffer zone for each pesticide and, and uh, species that's endangered, and it's in a big chart, and that's available to you on the California DPR website, 
Okay, it's, and Polo Moreno, that's his job, solely to go around and give presentations all over California on how to utilize this injunction. So you could invite him for free to uh, present to your group. What okay, Polo Moreno, M-O-R-E-N-O, just Google him, Cal CDPR Polo Moreno. Second thing, he's, he's also he's a wonderful PowerPoint presentation. And on the US EPA website, it, there's constantly updates about, so or af, as the years go by, sometimes the pesticides get taken off that list because the EPA determines with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, I believe it is, which ones are really not gonna be endangering protected and endangered species. Okay, the second thing I want you guys to know is about uh, the IPM policy. That's like a requirement for every public agency now to have an IPM policy. It's just boilerplate, it means nothing, right? Platitudes, but what you really wanna see to basically institutionalize a working, very like something with teeth is to make sure they have, if you can, get them to institutionalize a written policy with an approved, limited, and restricted list of pesticides, that's categories of pesticides of toxicity. And so what that means is that the staff needs to track what they're doing and that they attempted all the least toxic alternatives first before going to the more toxic. In my 16 years of experience, they've, the least toxics have never failed. Could, they could never justify more toxic pesticides. That is really important also to have this approved because a lot of the guys, they really don't want to think about you know, the toxicity. They just want you to give them a list. So safe self-containerized bait stations, crack and crevice treatment, for example, that's, one of the, that's on the approved list for the uh, policies we write. And then the limited is only if this fails, and then you could go to the limited, okay, without having to get, but then you have to also submit that justification to uh, the city council or their school board, right? Now, the restricted are the so-called bad actors that are defined by PANA, Pesticide Action Network North America, uh, probable and known human carcinogen. So that's the way we wrote it. But you could create whatever you want. It's up to you to create this policy, written policy. All right, the next thing I wanted to talk to you about is the spins used by industry to shut you down cold before you could even get a step into the door. All right, the three spins that we've seen the most commonly used uh, by the pesticide industry to train not only their clients, the maintenance people, the ones who buy the pesticides. I was told by one of the guys who at first, he was so resistant to us, I'm sure he hated my guts in the beginning, but he became an advocate for IPM after only like three years of trying it. It was amazing. Not only did he stop using pesticides, he went one step further and turned our, all our park system into organically maintained. And we didn't even ask for that. So I was amazed that he became an advocate for IPM and became so health conscious. I have a feeling that somebody in his family had cancer or something, or he might himself had suffered from it, because that's been my experience, and I'm sure you're gonna go through that too. Sometimes when the decision makers experience um, you know, suffering in their own family with cancer and autoimmune disease, they become much more sympathetic to these concerns. So what are the three spins? How much time do I have left? No way. All right, I'm so glad I didn't talk about my organization. <laughs> okay, number one, dose makes the poison. So it's dose makes the poison. Everything is toxic. You know, even water will kill you, okay? So yes, of course dose makes the poison, but that was what, 16th century, you know? I mean, this is not the 16th century. We're a little bit more educated than now. So then, so, what you do is that you let them know, now the scientists know better that can, uh, cancer-causing agents and hormone disruptors and reproductive toxins, there's no uh, safe levels of exposure. Any exposure to carcinogens, reproductive toxins, and to hormone disruptors could trigger disease. And so since um, the toxicity is accumulative with a lot of stress factors in the environment, UV radiation and stress and sleep deprivation and so on, you don't want to add another you know, uh, risk factor. 
And so, you know, we just try to be agreeable. You say thin face, and you say, oh, yes, yes. What was his name? Um, Paracelsus, yes, that's correct. He, he was a great physician in what, 15th or 16th century. You're absolutely correct. However, um, the, you know, the new research now shows that um, these three categories of uh, to toxins, hormone disruptors, carcinogens, and reproductive toxins, there's actually no uh, threshold for triggering disease. Okay. So sometimes unspinning it even before it, it gets brought up, because it, it's amazing. If you're in a public meeting, you have only a certain amount to speak, right? If they have an uh, industry representative give a public comment after you, you have no chance to go back and undo the spin. So you may want somebody to undo the spin. Everyone should you know, basically prepare for this, right? The second spin. Um, that's very commonly used is the LD50. You guys remember that? Has, that, has everybody, anybody been um, tried to spun by LD50? Okay, well, this is what they do. And you know what? University professors are also coached by the pesticide industry. This has happened to us, UC Davis. What, uh, yeah, a professor, researcher came in and used the LD50, and he's not even a toxicologist. He was a plant pathologist, but told our IPM advisory committee that glyphosate, there's nothing wrong with glyphosate. Look at this. Salt, caffeine, and aspirin is, is less toxic than, or, or is more toxic than glyphosate. You know what? He's right. He's not lying, but he forgot to tell us that LD50 is only lethal dose in which 50% of the animals die. You know what, what it means when an animal dies? That's acute toxicity. When they feed you know, the animals this poison and you measure the amount of time in which half of the species in your sample study die, right? So they don't tell you this is acute toxicity. They leave out chronic toxicity. So undo, preempt the spin before it happens, because it's going to ha happen behind your back. This happens all the time. OK, so the, it's the LD50 chart. Be careful about that, because I believe I, I give the benefit of the doubt to some of the public agency staff who are uh, basically coached by the pesticide industry that they really don't have the background to understand the difference. So acute and chronic toxicity is very critical. OK, my last one, the spin that they use especially in California, the Prop 65 list. How many people have experienced where the pesticide industry or the public agency that you're working with says, oh my god, so you, you complain that now um, glyphosate is on the Prop 65 list, a known human carcinogen? <laughs> Big deal. Guess what else is on the Prop 60 list? Hmm, sawdust. What else? Uh, what else did they say? No, sawdust, that's the one I brought up. No, no, no. The mineral oil was on it, but there was something else. So they try to find a substance that seems inert, that should not be. So it's like they try to undermine the Prop 65 list, like it is ridiculous. You know, it's like Prop 65 signs are all over the place. It's just, you know, bureaucratic garbage, right? So this is what you say. Well, oh, oh, that's what they did. Okay, they did use sawdust as an example. But I looked, you know, I also looked at the Prop 65 list and I was thinking, gosh, I hope that they don't bring up the fact that, you know, uh, milled flour. Did you know flour is on, the milled flour is on the Prop 65 list? So how do you respond to that? You know, right? This is how you respond to it. Gly sawdust. Yes, it is on the props, because you always try to be agreeable and you try to give them you know, kudos for, for, for just <coughs> knowing their material, right? So sawdust and milled flour, yes, that's on the list of props 65. Okay, just two minutes, sorry. Oh, okay, you guys could just you know, pull me out with the hook. Though. <laughs> but so what you say is these are occupational hazards that have been found historically to cause cancer in people who work in mills without respirators, uh, whether it be sawmills or in uh, flour mills. Uh, do we want to put children into sawmills and flour mills without respirators and give them cancer? No, 
lung cancer? That's because of the small particles. Why are we comparing glyphosate, you know, that has a complete different uh, mode of action for uh, carcinogenicity? Uh, and why do we want to compare that, you know? No, yes, milled flour in the way we use it is not a carcinogen, but in the way that um, the milled, the way the industry uses it, workers, yes. Yeah, you, don't, you wanna wear a respirator if you're working there. Glyphosate is a Prop 65 chemical and is very dangerous if, with uh, many modes of action uh, of exposure. So that is undoing the third spin, okay? But that is, those three are used very ubiquitously. And I think those were the um, little gold nuggets I wanted to share with you. And one more thing, I'm sorry. What our organization does is we do, um, we do uh, research, we educate, and then we do advocacy work, policy change. And very quickly with research, I wanna let you know that your in, in the United States, um, I, we found about 30% of the pesticides being used by any county is, is in the flood control district along the um, creek banks that are naturally occurring as well as connected to man-made structures. And our organization did uh, research, uh, field research uh, using 400 goats and we show, and then it was replicated by our public works department. And we showed that there's no contamination from goat grazing directly inside the creek where they have ac full access to the creek. And that there's no contamination downstream about 100 feet. And so now our county is starting to use goats directly on the flood control channel. This is major because this is uh, a huge pr proportion of pesticides being used uh, throughout the country. And I think the word is not out there yet. Uh, to this option. They, all the agencies assumed there would be contamination. And then finally, um, the other item that I wanted to mention was uh, the research and advocacy. If um, any of you would like training, uh, I do give webinars and we provide examples of how to write a public records request. We do pro pesticide profiling, our organization, is the only one that I know that actually does pesticide profiling and provide a toxicity chart to decision makers. The fastest we've ever been able to make a policy change is in five minutes. They stop using all pesticides after seeing the pesticide toxicity table, the, uh, what they're using and the associated toxicity with each one of them, all in a table. And then the second thing is if they're resistant, then we quantify everything and put graphs for every a, a toxicity category, carcinogen or reproductive toxin or hormone disruptor, we graphically show how much they're using in each area and it's very powerful. Um, and we have students, we train this um, technique to students and they present it to their own community. It's very powerful. So I just wanted to let you know, we could train you to do that. Um, we're extremely busy, but um, we would be, just really willing to help, especially underserved communities. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Those were great talking points.